Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the April 15 virtual Skeptics in the Pub for Triangle Skeptics. Uh, tonight, we have a fantastic guest, a liberal uh, living legend, Dr. Stephen Barrett, um, who was the founder of the Quackwatch Network, which is now a program of the Center for Inquiry. And Dr. Barrett's here again. This is his second appearance in front of our group to talk to us and give us a bit of an update on current trends in quackery. So um, let me just give everybody a little bit of an overview. We've been refining our, uh, our online meetings a bit. So this is being recorded, so don't say anything dumb, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my my post-production resources are few. Uh, mm -hmm. My time is pretty limited right now. So if I need to bleep anything, I'm gonna be really angry with you. Um, everybody's muted right now. You're free to unmute yourselves if you have questions. Um, speaking of questions, if anybody wants to put some questions into the queue, uh, you can do that using the group chat. Or um, we can just take questions as people unmute uh, if, there are, uh, if there are breaks in the action here. But uh, unless anybody else has anything to add, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Barrett. Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd be perfectly happy to, to have you uh, interrupt me because it's really much easier for me and more meaningful if I address your concerns and your questions rather than what may be on my mind. But I'll start with, with me, uh, but I really would like to uh, hear from each of you. Uh, I'm a retired psychiatrist. I began um, getting interested in quackery about 50 years ago when I read a book and got very upset about what I thought was you know, organized crime in the health field. Uh, I read another book and got more upset and did, you know what I did? I did absolutely nothing because there was nothing to do, um, but I was concerned. and. Um, by a interesting set of events, I um, uh, came upon some other people who were similarly interested and we decided to start a discussion group. And uh, that led to biweekly meetings for several years. And eventually we began communicating and a network set up that eventually became a national organization. And that was before the internet. Um, meanwhile, while I was practicing psychiatry, um, my interest in investigating grew. I love to um, do undercover investigations and see how things fit together and so on. And I gradually learned how to write by writing uh, the hard way, really. Um, took many, many years before I got to enjoy, to enjoy writing. That's my phone, don't it? Just, that's okay. Anyway, um, during the 1980s, I began cutting down my time as a psychiatrist and spending more time uh, responding to and uh, generating um, material about quackery. I finally retired in 1993 and then spent three years writing some major books and then the internet came along and I thought, well, I'll put a little something on there from, I have a college textbook and I would help my students by putting some things up. And then I discovered you can find things. And what used to take months could take a few days and now it can take minutes actually. So um, I got excited and I wound up uh, building one website after another because I like to have the websites with long indexes so that when you go there, you can see what's there rather than putting in some words and seeing if you can find anything. I wound up with 25 sites and um, um, fast forward about, well, it'd be a little over 20 years, I realized that um, my days on the planet are not infinite and I better do something to preserve what I've done. So I transferred everything I have 
to the Center for Inquiry. They're going to get my library uh, later this year and my files. And um, but I'll go on having a certain amount of fun investigating. So um, lately, what have I been looking at? Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about about regulation. Um, I've watched what's happened with uh, the COVID-19 situation. Nothing at all surprising, because what happens is that um, people who are many people who are involved in promoting quackery, and by that I mean um, things that are marketed with claims that um, that are unscientific. Um, that have no basis in reality. Um, people who are doing that are often interested in expanding what they can do. And what's happened is that is that just about every type of scam that existed before is being rolled over into COVID. And so you have tens of thousands of, of people or websites or companies that have adapted a new product line of one kind or another. A friend of mine some years ago called it rascal rollover. In, in the 1980s when AIDS came along, he made the observation that all of the can clinics that were offering cancer cures were now offering to treat AIDS as well. And he called that rascal rollover. And I, he, he really captured what's happened. So it's not just in health. Um, we have a page on Quackwatch now, uh, very easy to find. It's in the top of the hot topics um, on uh, COVID-19 uh, schemes and misinformation. Um, and there are more than a dozen areas where that are not even necessarily health related, where, um, because I'm most interested in misleading health and pseudoscientific health claims, but areas that are not necessarily health related have been adapted. For example, if you wanna buy a mask, there are lots and lots of people who are willing to take your order and not sell you a mask. They won't sell you anything. And if you're lucky, um, they won't even steal your identity, but you won't get the mask. Um, so there are mask schemes, there are financial schemes, there are work at home schemes, and they were all adapted to um, try to take advantage of public feelings about COVID-19. Now, we have anti-vaccination people and organizations, and um, there are now COVID vax. I guess there, there now is all sorts of sites are offering COVID vaccines that don't exist, <laughs> products to prevent it products to boost your immune system. I'll take a moment just to talk about that. Um, there's no such thing as boosting your immune system. The immune, immune system is complex. It has dozens and dozens of components. Um, if, you, if you want to have something called strengthening your immune system or boosting your immune system, you have to have a way of measuring it. So how do you measure the strength of the immune system? no such thing. It doesn't exist. Um, how do you measure weakness? Well, you know, maybe there are some people who are so malnourished who are getting chemotherapy. You can say that they're more susceptible, but that doesn't necessarily mean something called weakness, overall weakness of the immune system. It, it might just be some of the components. In any event, companies have been selling foods and or promoting foods and products to strengthen your immune system for guess how long? Turns out it's over a hundred years. Um, even before the immune system was remotely understood, um, there were people out there telling you you could boost your immunity by eating particular foods. And this is before vitamins were found and after vitamins were discovered, um, then vitamins became the thing and herbs became the thing. So with COVID, what's happened is now, um, there, if you go to Amazon and you put in immune booster, you'll get something like 4,000 hits. If you go on the internet and um, 
put in immune booster and price, which is how I search for products as opposed to just plain articles. Immune booster and price, you get millions. So apparently there are a lot of people who are selling a lot of products and they don't necessarily mention COVID-19 because if they did, they would become more vulnerable to prosecution. Now the, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, that's the FDA, they're not particularly efficient in the way in which they stop illegal marketing. Um, the FDA um, may send a warning letter to maybe one or two percent of the companies that should get them, maybe less. The FTC generally waits till they have a huge market impact. By that time, it's too late because you know, companies have taken in millions of dollars. But with COVID-19, there's now a federal state task force and they've gotten out letters, warning letters and other actions in matters of days. Nothing like that has ever been seen in uh, the history of consumer protection. And will it do some good? Eh, a little, be but the problem is really too big. Um, I don't know whether anything really significant can be done to stop the sale of worthless products through the internet. I really don't know, but I can tell you that I don't think anyone with any enforcement power has ever thought about the idea that maybe we should have some kind of task force or group that tries to figure it out. I don't think anyone has ever thought of the idea of is there some kind of strategy that would be optimal? If they have, I can tell you they haven't shared it with me and I've been trying to network with um, uh, agencies for uh, decades. I used to, back in the 80s, I had very close contacts with the major consumer protection agencies, but they seem to have shifted more toward protecting the rights of I don't know who, and as a result, they don't say much to non-agency people. So I'm now much more, I didn't feel like an outsider in the 1980s, but I am now. Anyway, um, I did get a, um, a, a very nice invitation from Facebook. Facebook has a, a policy team that um, discusses what they can do about misinformation and things like that. And I know that there's information on the net that, that shows that they've been concerned about vaccination. They realize that the spread of misinformation about vaccination can kill you. And I had a very nice um, Zoom chat actually with uh, one of the main policy teams. And we talked about the difference between um, various levels of harm and generally people want to know, well, what's the most dangerous stuff? And my response is that that's not something I pay attention to. I'm more interested in, because anything, the danger doesn't lie just in the product. It lies with the recipient because Somebody who is not sick, if you're not sick, it may not matter what you believe. If you are sick, it makes a lot of difference what you choose to do. And so a product that's completely harmless and does absolutely nothing um, is not going to hurt somebody who isn't sick. But the same product, if bought instead of what you need, can wind up killing you. So. Um, the news media and most people who contact me who want an opinion start out by saying, well, what do you think are the most significant things, the most important, the most dangerous? And that's not, um, that's not enough. Um, I do pick out a couple that I think are the most outrageous, uh, chelation therapy, the idea that you can put something in someone's veins and 
unclog his coronary arteries. Uh, there's a quack device that, uh, um, uh, there are a number of quack devices that they put an electrode on your skin and claim they can find your electromagnetic blockages and uh, recommend products. This, the lack of science in, in there outrages, um, enrages me, so to speak. So, uh, so that's um, uh, some of my ideas about the, the current uh, marketplace. We just have too much bad stuff. Um, too many people are, are vulnerable. They don't understand enough. Um, there are a lot of smart people. There are quacks who have special ways of convincing smart people. A lot of smart people have been convinced that vaccination is uh, dangerous. And uh, uh, fortunately, um, and question has arisen, what, what can be done for the internet to stop that? Very strange thing happened. Uh, somebody did an experiment. Um, they took a group of people and um, exposed them to uh, information that would debunk false information. In other words, um, they would try to counter the misinformation, specific types, and then they measured the effect on the audience and they found that there was increased fear as a result of debunking. It was not effective. So that simply trying to persuade somebody, uh, trying to persuade a community that vaccination is safe may actually result in a higher level of fear. That's discouraging, and but I can understand it. it, it you know, they hear the scary words, and they don't necessarily hear the rest. You can. And so, uh, Paul Offit, uh, one of the top vaccine experts, said, "You can. People are easy to scare, and very hard to unscare." So the way to counter the anti-vaccination movement is, guess what? Try to muzzle them and destroy their communication channels. It's not to argue. Debating non-debatable subjects doesn't work. So what can be done? Um, there have been suggestions made to um, some of the main players, Facebook, search engine companies, and so on, block anti-vaccination groups, block the misinformation, don't allow it to circulate. Oh, horrors, we have freedom of speech, you might think. Well, maybe we do. But the question is whether we, does it serve us? Um, should there be limits? And I would say, well, you can't, you're not allowed to cry fire in a crowded theory, theater if there isn't any. And that's, nobody argues with that, but should you be able to argue poison if a community fluoridates or poison or whatever, uh, seizures, autism, you name it, if a community vaccinates, um, causes harm, it can even cause death. So the question is whether the people who control the flow of information should allow misinformation, to what extent should they allow misinformation to flow? And that's complicated because how do you decide, how do you decide what is misinformation and what is not? Who's to decide? Um, those are different questions. I think the question, the fundamental question is, should a company that has the power to influence the flow of misinformation use that power to cut off misinformation? And my answer is a resounding, absolutely. And to people who say, well, that violates our freedom of speech, I say, tough luck. Um, if you want, you know, in stopping you from speaking, freedom of speech in a democracy means that the government should not have the right to punish you 
for your opinions. You should be free to express them. That doesn't mean that a private company has to allow anybody to express anything. There are certain laws that, you know, they limit defamation. Um, but uh, for the most part, we are pretty free. And I would hope, um, I mean, it, it, the companies that, ha that control it don't go out of their way to say what they're doing, but there are other people who are complaining. Some people have complained that they're, that Google has decreased their ability to be seen by search engines. Face people have complained that Facebook has taken down certain groups. Nothing to do with me. Um, as before they talk to me. Uh, I hope that continues and is, is magnified. Um, those groups will have plenty of other places to meet. They just won't be able to do it, get into the networks that can reach tens of millions of people easily. Let them make their own, you know, if they want to be heard, they can work at it, but I don't, I think that the major channels should stop it. And I think that should not allow them. And I think that at some point that Amazon should be engaged um, so that it doesn't allow the sale of quack products. I don't know whether that would be welcomed by them because they make a lot of money from it. I'm not sure that, I don't know whether that makes any difference. It may be that they're more concerned about how do you judge what's good and what isn't? And do we have the time to do it? Is there an actually a way to do it? Can you do it with an algorithm? Answer, no, probably no. Um, so those are weighty questions. I've been exploring a little bit with Amazon. Today I sent them a, a comment saying that such and such a product is a fraud. That's not easy to say, by the way, but this one happens to be so clear cut. Uh, Somebody is selling a, a test. You take five strands of hair and you send it to the company. They'll tell you if you have any nutrient imbalances. They'll tell you if you have allergies and some other things. And they do it with bioresonance. I don't know what that is. So um, um, I've asked uh, Jeff if he'd be kind enough to try to find out. I'm not going to explore that one because I might recognize my name. but. I'm hoping Jeff will be able to um, get the company to talk about their mechanism. Then I can write an, a nasty article about them. And then I can also uh, pester Amazon and um, the center of inquiry might even have the capacity to file a lawsuit to stop them. And um, I think we'll get Amazon, if, if the CFI wants to get Amazon attention the way you know, you never know when you write to a company with hundreds of thousands of employees. You never know who's going to who's going to get it, but a, a lawsuit will certainly get their attention. And and um, uh, CFI has sued a, some um, billion dollar corporations over their sale of homeopathic products. Um, they've got their attention, and uh, I don't know what the outcome will be. So. Uh, I can go on. Um, I would hope that some of you have some questions at, at this point, or if not, I'll just I'll just uh, uh, continue. Any questions so far? Comments? Yes. Uh, I've got, I've, go ahead. Okay. I think you're at what you're talking sometime called the backfire effect, where people uh, you, you you try to refute something and then that strengthens it. Yes. I'm, Curious about the quality of the experiments that determine that. I could see if somebody says Mount Fuji is the ma highest mountain in the world, and 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 then you tell them no, it isn't. It's uh, it's uh, Mount uh, Everest. That that they they more likely to think Mount Fuji is the high, highest mountain in the world than they did before. But if you said you know that the vaccine are not harmful, then you went into a lengthy explanation of the tests that have been done to show that, you know, you know, with large numbers of people and the percentages that get that had harm and, and what happened when people didn't take the vaccines. Uh, if you gave a good explanation instead of just a like one sentence refutation, would would the backfire effect go away? 
Uh, a good question. Um, I don't remember the contents of the paper. I do believe it was a, a well-designed experiment and that the people who did it were quite stunned by the result. Uh, if you uh, send me an email, I'll try to find the, the study and, um, and uh, send it to you. My recollection, this is about a year ago, uh, my recollection is that uh, it, it, was, it was not just as simple, uh, that, the, that there was some substance to the campaign. Okay. All right. Thank you. The thing I recall in that vein was there was a follow-up study by a separate group that found that the initial uh, strength of the backfire effect may have been overstated. Um, and to their credit, the, uh, the, the group that ran the initial study did not exhibit the backfire effect when presented with evidence that they may have overestimated the strength of the effect. Hmm. Um, don't know. I didn't, I didn't follow it after that. I've seen um, in a community, in, in a community I used to live in, um, the backfire effect of a, an attempt to educate the public about fluoridation. Um, there was an enormous amount of information uh, given and Unfortunately, the the uh, the vehicle for doing this was the newspaper, and so the anti-fluoridationists made their statements, and the fluoridationists made theirs. And there was one instance when um, there was a debate that was widely televised, and uh, in the audience for the debate were a hundred dentists. They they didn't find a dentist who was against it who could sit in the audience, so you had a panel and. An or a completely one-sided audience, and um, it just pounded on the anti-fluoridationists. It didn't really, uh, it, it seemed that it made the situation worse. Um, hmm. We, I came to the conclusion you can't run an education campaign by having a debate in the newspaper because it becomes a matter of he said, she said, and, and it makes things, um, the fact that there's a hundred people on one side and one person on the other doesn't get across yeah. or didn't. Um, right. You're a psychiatrist and um, you know, it seems to me that yes, what you just said, unfortunately people aren't necessarily reachable by reason and by data. People, have an emotional reaction. And I think that's what drives them to these <laughs> irrational <laughs> conclusions. So from a psychiatry point of view, is there anything that, that you can think of to influence those people into getting away from these, from these emotional knee-jerk reactions that this or that product must be just the cat's meow? Um, no across the board formula. I have a number of concepts. Um, I used to talk to all the people who were on city council and running for city council about fluoridation. And I used a technique that I called peeling the onion. And um, I would ask them, um, do they think that it's safe? Fluoridation, that is. And I would take it from there. What is the basis of your... I would try to find out the basis of their belief and how it came about and where, what they're relying on and where their trust is placed and attempt to get underneath that. And if they were willing to go through that process, they almost always shifted their position or clarified it to the point where that I would like it. Um, in dealing with um, misinformation I th on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you try to find out the basis of the person's belief. Now, they may not want to tell you, in which case, I don't know what else you can do. Uh, try to get, there's usually a fear, try to get at it. Where does it come from? Who do you trust, et cetera. On a community-wide basis, it doesn't work very well because you, you can't peel the onion of a community. It is, you have, it's, it's a technique that's, limited to a one-on-one -on -one basis. You have to find out what 
you have to get at the basis of of how they form their trust and there may be there are a lot of people who who you just can't do this with they don't have the ability you know you don't necessarily know what's going on they may have a an inner distrust that is so strong but also not revealed um they may feel that and and, and that the fact that some people are hard to persuade um, is one of the reasons why I think it's important to try to prevent them from hearing the junk in the first place. And people tend to believe what they hear the most. And I personally would love to see um, some controls or ability to control the amount of or determine the amount of misinformation they get. In the 1980s, before the internet, um, I had a very interesting experience because before that time, um, there was a very high use of diet of vitamin supplements. During the 1980s, um, the network that I was involved in was able to really dominate the conversation. We had the trust of the major outlets, um, and I and some of my colleagues were quoted in tens of thousands of articles um, about most people don't need to take vitamins and if you want to know if you need them you know have your diet checked and see and public opinion at that time appeared to be that most people don't need vitamins you can get it in your food and this was perceived by the health food industry the dietary supplement industry and they actually ran a campaign designed at that very point. And um, we tried to fight that. We wound up in a battle over whether their advertising on that point was truthful or not and so on. But that shifted with the, with the internet. There's so much opportunity to get, a, get across the wrong ideas that um, there's no longer that kind of, of um, ability to influence i don't i don't know what the average belief is at the moment it's probably much more mixed than it used to be um, in the 1980s so yeah it seems to me that critical thinking skills are kind of lacking <laughs> yes and that's yeah absolutely well <laughs> i don't know if i want to get into the most obvious <laughs> the, the most obvious sign of lack of critical thinking um, yeah. is probably obvious in two aspects of our society. Um, one is on the issue of, of um, sensible gun use ownership. And the other one is, you know, who you vote for. Um, we are really in trouble. And, um, you know, you never know where it's going to wind up. I, speaking of... Um, of that, I want to point out um, how um, what's happened with coronavirus has exceeded, was beyond what I could imagine. When I, I've been um, a critic of Trump uh, long before he was a candidate, he was involved in a multi level company where you know you buy a distributor kit and then you try to sell stuff to your friends and they try to sell it to their friends, you get a commission and so on. There was a company called Ideal Health where they marketed a urine test that supposedly could tell you what you need and then they would sell you a custom vitamin. Well, the test wasn't valid and I had an article about it. And lo and behold, um, it became, I'm not sure exactly how it came about, but Donald Trump became the figurehead for the company. I think they licensed his name and were, they told distributors to rename the Trump network and they told distributors that Trump was now involved in the, um, the, uh, in the business model. And this made it much more certain that they would be successful. Well, it turns out Trump merely licensed his name and, and didn't pay much attention to 
what was happening, but they had the same scam. So that was one. I was I wrote about that, and then of course there was Trump University where he. Um, I'm not sure how much he was directly involved, but he certainly knew what was happening. Where they sold the idea that he was a great businessman, and if you spent a lot of money, maybe twenty-five thousand dollars, you could learn all the Trumpian methods. It turns out that uh, they didn't offer very much, and and um, most of it had to do with how they persuaded people to to join. And then they had something called a playbook. It came out in court where it talked about how you wrote people in, and all that's on one of my one of my websites about how the Trump network worked. And that was all before he ran for president. And when he became president, I thought I became concerned because during the campaign he came out against vaccination, and um, he said that one of his he that he got a call from a mother whose beautiful child came down with autism the day after, right after vaccination. And he just got that call during their campaign. Problem was, he said the same thing four years previously. So whether he, he actually ever got a call or whether he said he just got one when it was four years before, I don't know. But he, that was the first clue that I had about his, his honesty and his willingness to, he got a lot of flack for that. It didn't make any difference. His willingness to gravitate toward unscientific ideas. Now he gets in office and he pretty much destroys the government agencies that have to deal with epidemics. And we see what's happened. So enough of that. But it's uh, but it's sad. And he's got you know he's a lot of people believe in him, and that's very very scary. But, so. Okay. Uh, I could, I guess, if no one else has any questions, I'll go on to another topic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody, um, I do have something I'd like to inject. This is this is a personal anecdote from my own life. Uh, since we're talking a moment ago about arguing on social media, um, I got into it a little bit with a uh, Facebook friend not too long ago, uh, who was reposting some, uh, some information, information from the Instagram feed of uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's a noted anti-vax conspiracist and also a progressive Democrat. Uh, so this Facebook friend of mine is um, no fan of anybody with a D by their name who's in politics but was touting essentially how open-minded he is because he believes this nonsense that somebody who's normally his enemy or his perceived enemy is, um, is advancing. And he, he seems to think that that really yield or lends some kind of armor to his, to his argument. I'm wondering how much you've seen that specific sort of thing where people think, oh, I'm reaching across the aisle or whatnot. Uh, and that, that lends some credibility to my position. I've also been trying to classify that into a lot, an, an informal logical fallacy in my mind and coming up maybe appeal to authority, but it seems some, like something more specific than that. Um, people sometimes, um, I think the, the 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 concept I'm thinking of is is a resonance that is people sometimes resonate with something else about another person and therefore may trust them um, and if they have one thing in common it may make them feel that the other person is trustworthy I'm not sure that's what you're describing, but the best example I have, I have on a frequent basis, um, there's a, a retired uh, surgeon by the name of Lorraine Day, who uh, has a 
uh, whose income is centered around the sale of, of videos where she talks about how she cured herself of cancer. And she represents herself as a, as a Christian and uses the language of, I guess, evangelical Christians. And I've had every, every month or two, I get a really nasty, um, oh, she didn't cure herself of cancer. She put her a biopsy report on the internet to show that she had it, but she didn't put the operative report on the internet to show what happened when she had her last operation. And I'm willing to bet my life that she was cured by local surgery in any event. And I put out a pretty strong argument. I think I put up the, the medical records and show what's missing and point out how the records that I have contradict what she says to some extent. And the fact that I've asked her for the rest of the records and she won't give them to me, claiming privacy, that's an invasion of her privacy. Um, she has a video that shows her bare breast <laughs> that she's selling or sold so much for privacy, but a record of her third operation is private. Anyway, she says she cured herself with diet and prayer and she has all the trappings of an evangelical Christian. I don't know if she actually is one. She started out, I think, as a Seventh-day Adventist. Whether she converted or not, I don't know. So people condemn me and, said, and say all kinds of things about I'm Satan and I attack it. this Christian woman and blah, blah, blah. And it's clear that they resonate with, they don't, they don't pay any attention to the fact that the details of what she says don't fit what they, they're doing and don't fit what the people think you should do. But she's a Christian and therefore she's telling the truth and I'm a Satan and I'm a liar. So that's, I call that resonating. And it happens. I don't know. It probably happens in, in a lot of different ways. Why do people form trust? Um, it may be because the person looks like you in some way. Uh, people tend to trust people who are their countrymen, I guess, over people who are not. And there are all kinds of things that promote trust or distrust. So I think that's what you're, what you're talking about. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty close match. Maybe something about a shared experience and a perceived shared enemy. Right. Yeah. I still I still see that that dichotomy between uh reason and and emotion. And I think, I mean, it seems to me, you know, there's there's just these re these emotional reactions they're they're probably looking for some sort of hope for whatever it is they want for themselves and that leads them to you know uncritically accepting all all sorts of stuff but i you know you can't you cannot convince these people with reason i have i have totally found that out i mean they're just they did they're absolutely not accessible to reason. Um, well, you're right. It, there could be a number of different emotions that may look the same on the surface. It could be, it could be fear, as well as false hope. Um, with cancer, I think it tends to be more fear, and there's some justification, except they're not looking at it rationally. But fear and hope are two of the main the main things i think on a one on one basis it's possible to get through to some people on misinformation but i can tell you something else that if i sense that the person i'm talking to can't be reasoned with i stop mm -hmm. bang i'm done um if I think there's hope, I will 
attempt to be helpful. And I've talked to, I've had, um, I generally express their fear. I mean, I'm fairly decent at this. I talk to a lot of people. I try to get behind what's the matter. And I'm successful a fair amount of the time. They're not successful other times. And I point out, for example, you know, you're arguing with me, but you called me. You know, did you call me just to argue or do you want, do you want to pay attention to what I say? Or, I mean, there are a lot of techniques involved in the attempt to have a conversation. But, you know, if they can't stop talking, that's a bad sign. They keep interrupting. That's a bad sign. No, the bad signs. But, but I, you know, I try to tell whether they're beginning to resonate with what I say or not, and um, I try. Um, and if they, but there are a lot of people that are, that are not reachable. They're so alienated that I don't think there's any way to get get through to them. There are a lot of them. I mean, I. I'll give you one example of, it, um, of what you're dealing with. Um, I hope this example doesn't offend anybody, but if it does, you know, too bad. <laughs> you know, we went to a, I'm very much concerned about the issue of too many guns, and I think that that's a dangerous thing. But we went to a, a rally for one of the people, my, it was a town hall meeting, that was discussing the subject and they invited the two candidates, Republican and Democrat, to come to the meeting. It turns out the Republican didn't come and the Democrat came and there were about a hundred people who came and I talked a little bit about why people are afraid that they, you know, the kinds of fears that people have and so on. And a man took the, waited his turn and said, it's very important that we be able to buy AK-15 rifles, he says, because if I'm not home and they come bursting through the door with guns, I want my wife to be able to defend herself. That's simply an example of somebody you can't reason with. Um, yeah. I wonder how he gets through life, but he apparently does. Yeah. Well, we have heard that gun sales have spiked in these last couple of weeks. So <laughs> yeah. it's a clear indication of, of what you're saying. Um, now, you have spent obviously many years trying to um, promote reason. And is there anybody taking over for you? Uh, yes. Um. The, um, all of my writings will be um, permanently perpetuated uh, by the Center for Inquiry. They, they now, um, uh, it's sort of an informal arrangement, although we have a contract. They now own the websites. Uh, I simply administer them. Um, at some point when they, when the, they were about to hire someone to formally administer the sites. Unfortunately, contributions have dropped off because of the, the financial problems associated with the collapse of our economy. So they don't have enough money at the moment, but presumably that'll come back and they're gonna hire somebody, probably have time to maintain and update the sites uh, permanently. Um, but even if they're not updated, they're still there. There's 7,000 articles um, on, this, on their server now. And they're getting my, my library. Um, and um, about, about uh, 4,000 books and uh, about 40 file cabinets. We're all going up there within the next year or so. I've but seen your library, and that's changed. quite a thing to think about moving. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, it'll be maintained, and they're going to hire somebody, and they're interested in the subject. I mean, they've been they've been writing about many of the topics that I cover, not as intensely, and I'm enriching what they have. And I think they'll they'll be doing more. There is a group of about a, a dozen uh, people who are in their fifties and sixties who who write the science based medicine blog, 
and they're outstanding. They all do very, very high quality investigating and writing. Um, they're not that interested in affiliating with the Center for Inquiry at the moment, maybe at some point they will, but the, the Center for Inquiry will attract um, individuals who are interested in and will um, and will uh, organize them. It's uh, it's here to stay. It has a a budget, an annual budget of probably about seven million dollars, and uh, it's it's uh, here to stay. So yes, so I will be uh, perpetuated. <laughs> and by the way, I want to tell you that, that Jeff did a an undercover investigation. Uh, for me, that uh, worked out uh, just beautifully. He, I, I became concerned about a uh, a man who's marketing an amino acid system um, for the treatment of Parkinsonism and many other diseases. And uh, Jeff called up his clinic to pretending to be a patient to see exactly how they treat new patients and recorded it and figured that out. And it was helpful and I was able to, um, I made a complaint with the licensing board and they, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what they've made him stop doing, but every claim, his website now is completely empty. They're reformulating. They fined him $10,000, told him that a lot of the claims he made were not acceptable don't know what guidelines they left him with, but um, um, they know exactly how he operated because Jeff uncovered the details and I shared them with, the, I gave the transcripts to the board. So it was uh, pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, there are just so many, many fires to put out. <laughs> it probably seems like pushing a boulder uphill, you're never done. Well, but I, but I maintain a, um, I, I maintain an even keel because, you know, what makes people frustrated, people get frustrated when uh, you compare their goals with their achievements. And I set low goals. I'm a realist. I don't expect to be able to, um, I mean, there's a limit as to what can be done. Um, one of the people who, um, one of the, the former uh, anti-quackery leaders, uh, Dr. William Jarvis, um, put it very uh, cleverly when he said that, that um, you know, you never can get rid of garbage. He says, you put it out on your curb and the trucks come and they take it away but it doesn't solve the problem of garbage because you keep making more. And he says, can you imagine what would happen if the trucks didn't come? So same thing with quackery. You can't solve the problem. You can do a little bit here and there. And um, that's what I do more than a little. I, um, I know that I'm successful in that I get many, many, I get a lot of feedback from people who have been helped, uh, people who've saved tens of thousands of dollars. I even got a call once from Australia or New Zealand. A man said he had a plane ticket to go to a clinic in Texas and it would have cost him $100,000 because his wife was sick and he had to hire somebody to go with them to take care of her, plus the fees at the clinic, which he underestimated. And he read my he read my article and canceled his ticket, <laughs> so he saved over a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, but I know there are a lot of people that get their money back after they talk to me for something that they were involved in, or probably lots of people avoid getting taken. But there are still you know tens of millions who who do get chipped, and uh, all I can do is put the information out there and try to call attention to it. Um, by the way, I have a free newsletter. If um, comes out once a week, if you wanna find out what uh, neat things are 
are happening. Um, I wrote it for almost 20 years, and now um, you asked what's happening to what I do. Uh, Dr. William London, a professor at uh, in California, has taken over as as uh, editor and is now uh, is taken as primary author. So I only spend a few minutes a week now, which is really neat. If it comes out once a week. If you just go to the top of Quack Watch, it says free newsletter, and okay. you can sign up. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Outstanding. Any other questions? I had a question about uh, the Corona stuff. Um, I've heard that uh, somebody that I know that they're scientifically literate, but uh, they were advancing this conspiracy theory, I guess, that they said that um, initially the C nobody should wear masks because they don't work. And then, uh, but then they reverse that decision and say that people should start wearing masks. Uh, and his idea in his mind is that uh, the, they knew that masks worked, but uh, they had some, some ulterior motive for first telling us that they didn't work. Um, I just wanted to hear your opinion on that or if you knew anything about about that, I haven't had a chance to uh, myself to well, look in. in terms of what he said was, I mean, if you wanted to have to draw out the conversation, you could ask, where does that idea come from, and try to trace back where he got the idea. What are the facts? Um, I mean, the facts are fairly simple, and I don't know that. Um, I mean, the scientific community, scientific community has said the same thing continuously. Uh, the president has, has flip-flopped uh, to some extent. I mean, the facts are very simple, that uh, there's such a thing as mask quality, that um, there are uh, N95 masks that are made to try to block the virus from coming in as well as going out. There are other masks, um, any old mask um, will to some extent um, block the spread of droplets that come out of your mouth and nose. So the primary purpose of wearing a mask now is to protect other people. It also can protect you because you can't um, put your hand onto your nose when you're wearing a mask. So there's, there's also some degree of protection about incoming particles, depending upon the weave of the mask and how tight it fits your face and so on. It may block uh, um, to some extent what comes through. Some of the particles are small enough that they'll go through most masks, but um, they may also um, hit the mask and, and stick to it instead. So wearing a mask will protect the you will protect other people because it won't allow you to spread what you got six feet away for the most part. Whatever you're exhaling is much of it is going to be. I mean, the wind of the exhale is not going to travel as far, probably very, very little. So if you happen to be contagious and you wear a mask, you won't be contagious from six feet away anymore. So wearing a mask protects other people. It also furnishes some level of protection depending on the quality of the mask. And I can, from my experience, I started wearing one. I don't go out much go to the supermarket, um, about 20% of the people are wearing masks. And I can tell you that, that um, it's very comfortable to, when you're walking and the only people you come in contact with are people wearing masks four feet away. And I feel basically um, very safe. I mean, sometimes people who are not wearing masks can leave droplets that are circulating in the air and so on. 
but the dose you get is less and the odds of getting it are not as high. So yes, uh, wear a mask. Uh, it, it is better than not wearing a mask. It is not fully protective. It's certainly not harmful to wear a mask. And, and um, N95 masks are hard to get. Um, they're, um, I mean, I, I went online to see if you can get one. There are lots of offers that I think are probably frauds. The major distributors, I mean, like Amazon and Walmart and so on, um, they say it'll be at least two or three months and uh, uh, it'd probably be longer than that. So the priority is being given to health workers and so on. I would, uh, I would add to that N95 masks really only work to protect you if they're fitted well uh, and your, your face is smooth, which is why I don't have a beard anymore. Uh -huh. uh, you, they have to be fitted specifically for you. You have to do what's called a fit test. Uh, if they're fitting loose, and I see people with N95 masks and they don't want to put on the bottom strap and it's just hanging over their chin so the mask is loose. If you wear it like that, you're really not um, getting any extra protection than you would with a cloth mask or a surgical mask. Hmm. Uh, and if it fits properly, I will tell you, since I have to wear them occasionally at work, uh, it's really hard to breathe through them. Uh, you can't really wear them for long periods of time. I mean, I, I will occasionally put one on because I have one. We're short now, so you get one N95 mask. And that's, and that's your mask, and you have to clean it and uh, sterilize it and store it away in a bag so no one touches it. Um, but uh, I can wear it maybe for a brief period of time in the supermarket. Um, you also can't hear anyone when they're wearing an N95 mask uh, because it muffles your voice so much. Uh, mm. but, but I am a proponent of wearing surgical masks if you can get them and they are available uh, or even cloth masks in that they protect, as you said, they protect other people. If a majority of us or a good percentage of us all wore proper masks, um, then we wouldn't have that much spread of disease. And, and that's something I find very common in, uh, in Singapore and in China and Korea when I've been there. Uh, if you look at photographs pre-pandemic uh, in a crowd, you'll always see a couple of people wearing a face mask. And they wear that not to protect them. I mean, some people wear it because of the pollution levels, uh, but they wear it because there's a societal duty to protect other people. Uh, and if you go out and you're coughing and sneezing in any of these countries, uh, you get a lot of glares from people if you're not wearing a mask. So um, I, I do tell people um, to consider wearing a mask because it protects, as you said, it protects other people. Uh, the problem with the masks is that, and they've done studies videoing people with masks, uh, including medical students, is that people touch their faces more when they're wearing a mask than if they're not wearing a mask. So people will put a mask on and they'll They'll keep doing that and readjusting it so their fingers are going near their nose and mouth more than if they didn't have a mask on. Hmm. So I, I think one of the things we need to do is educate the public on how to properly use protective equipment. And it's very easy to do. Um, a simple poster or a PSA could do that. I would imagine that when masks become available, there'll be lots of information on how to use them properly. Yeah, we should. The same thing for gloves. I mean, I'm, I'm astounded by the way people wear gloves and then touch everything around them. I'm always watching people with gloves on in the supermarket and they, they're handling all their equipment and they're on their cell phone and then they rub their face with the gloved hand. So um, I think we're doing more harm than good sometimes with these uh, pieces of equipment without the education. I don't even think education will help because I've, I'm only leaving the house to go to the grocery store and to exercise. And we have the greenway right behind us. And 
people are not being mindful of the six foot distance. I've been almost run over by strollers where people with their babies are coming like up in my space. And I've tried, we've tried running with masks on. It's not great. <laughs> We're seeing all the articles pop up about the spray of your breath. So I've just resorted to running on the sidewalk and actually in the streets in my neighborhood because I can actively move out of people's way and not have to deal with other people. But it's astounding me just how many people with their children who have a hard time anyway dealing with all these constraints are not being mindful of the spaces and meeting each other out for little social events. It's, and it's like you're saying with the gloves. I just, and people want to go back to work now. And it's just, it's astounding to me that people, and I think like what you were also saying about the CDC reversing stuff, I think people have a hard time trusting where all this information is coming from because it's constantly changing. And then you have people in like Trump, the high, you know, the higher ups in the leadership where they're, you know, threatening to remove the, the one doctor that is going against everything he's saying. So I think, you know, there's, there's so, too much um, mistrust of information because you, you have an idiot in charge. <laughs> yeah. it, the, I think there's a, a lot of difference from one neighborhood to the next. I can tell you that, and, and, and some stores are different from other stores. I can tell you that I've been in a couple of Trader Joe's and uh, uh, you have to line up six feet apart. They only allow 40 people in the store at a time. And um, they w wipe the carts with uh, alcohol before you touch them. And they have a whole routine, I think, that is uh, outstanding. Uh, I was online at a farmer's market in my community, which is Farrington. And I can tell you that about half the people were wearing masks and people stood six feet apart all over the place. No one came near anybody. <laughs> but that's a, we have a very educated community. We don't have any cases here that I know of. And, uh, but um, we have a, I, I think we'll be, uh, you know, we feel fairly safe. All right, sounds like a lull in question time. Uh, Dr. Baird, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, no. We're, we're theoretically at time, but we'd be happy to listen to you all night. Yeah, thanks. If, if anyone does have questions, uh, um, my email address is uh, very simple to find on the website and uh, you know, get my newsletter. Contact me if you have anything else you want to share, I'd be fine. That's about, that's about it. Perfect. All right. Uh, does anybody have a magic trick? This is usually the time in the evening where we have a magic trick. Well, we'd like this to be the time in the evening where we have somebody do a magic trick. Hmm. <clears throat> the last time it was Joel, who was our speaker, who said, I can push this button and make all of you go away. <laughs> so we may just have to be satisfied with that trick again. Um, so unless anybody else has anything to add. All right. I thank all of you for coming. Dr. Barrett, I really, really appreciate you rejoining us. Uh, we're, we're always happy to hear from you. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Stay safe out there and stay skeptical. Yeah, you all. Thank you um, for being here.